All right. So do we have to talk about the schedule of the agenda at all? Or we have an hour and a half to two hours that morning. I went through Mark's uh, presentation and it's about 30 slides. Um, some of our introductory and, and at the end, but I didn't know Q&A, what time and with all the other folks well, involved. I, I assume that I would uh, that we would give Mark a full hour or close to a full hour. If okay. there's no more questions, then obviously we would switch over and to NRCS and and then we might be done in a little bit because I what I told NRCS is that um, you know we were looking at a half an hour to 45 minutes as a program overview and all the information and then question and answers and then people could stay for whenever if they wanted to do the applications or start the application process. I, I believe March 8th is the, first, is the next um, deadline for a lot of these things. So there could be a lot of interest. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's more, I, I, I'm really excited about Mark Stenson coming and explaining to people what they can and cannot do. And I know he's gonna go over a lot of stuff, Pete. I love his slide deck. But really, people in this uh, forum, hopefully people will feel safe to ask questions like what if questions. So it's a lot different than having Mark sit at their property and answer questions while he's looking at something. So I'm hoping this is what Henry will portray to people, that this is a good venue to ask questions. And I hope we have a real good, robust amount of time and I and I feel it is probably one of the most important things with all our flooding that people get their questions answered. So right. okay. I, I wouldn't put a time frame on Pete. I mean uh, uh Mark, Mark and and if you can convey that Pete that would be great. And then NRCS is fine filling in. Okay. Yeah but, I'll talk to uh, Mark. Yeah they're just... really flexible. Rita has was a long time um district conservationist for like 25 years so she knows just about everybody so it, it should be very low-key and um comfortable for people right and henry do you have an idea of number of farmers that might i mean i would hope i'd hope you know as many i i've talked to i'd say probably shy of 10 as of now just relatives and whatnot but uh i mean i i would hope that you'd see all of them i mean as far as day-to-day -day goes i don't know people are going to have but i hope as many people as we can get yeah great. i hope i hope once once i get on facebook that'll attract even more and also i mean as far as um i know we opened it up we added which i thought was was great was adding everyone as well as landowners not just farmers specifically because i think that is a part of that picture too so i, I would assume with that addition there'd be quite a few people good yeah the conservation commission has had two inquiries on different projects mm -hmm. over the last couple of weeks. So we've invited them yeah. to show up too, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> and, and what's exciting is that they can hear Mark's presentation and then they can actually apply for programs that would complement the best practices to, to work with what Mark is talking about. I mean, is, is there gonna be a place where if they, or, or a person that they can contact if they have follow-up questions when well, they get home? That's why we're gonna have um, uh, Franklin Conservation District representative, Megan, we'll have Mark, uh, Michael Left from the Mass Association so that people can meet them in person and have their contact information if they don't feel comfortable going direct to NRCS. But one of the reasons I'm so excited is Rita, is a local farmer. She's her, her husband has a dairy farm in the hills. So, yeah. and she's been doing this for well, gen yeah. a couple of generations. She worked with Henry's grandfather and father. So I know that you, you know she. So it should be really comfortable, and and that's what we're trying to do is prevent um, anyone feeling yeah. worried that this is a regulatory thing, or that you you don't you have to do certain things explain that you don't have to do certain things to just apply for the programs you know denise i have a question so if if some of the farmers can't make it that day um 
Well, we're going to have, well, hopefully well, we're going to have FCAT tape it. Right. So they can tape it. You, they can hear about it. But then afterwards, what's the next steps you need to tell, you know, what, how can they get help after watching? That, well, there's the Greenfield office of the Franklin Hunter. Okay. It's, it's just getting that across to them. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. what I was just wondering. Thank you. There's an actual office. Okay. Maybe we could get somebody to put it, put together an information sheet and then we can hold it in front of the camera. So they watch the thing, they get the information. Yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. I, 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 we can do that. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask Rita to hand it some. out too. Yeah. yeah, I meant the people who couldn't come. Yeah. So if they happen to watch the video, they can see what they can think. Who could, yeah, who but they it, can it, might, it might be helpful to have a handout of everybody yeah. to contact, as well as Mark Stenson's contact yeah. information, because people might have follow-up questions. But the idea is hopefully we'll have, like I said, a real robust question and answer so most people will feel comfortable in this sort of anonymous venue to ask questions that might pertain to their property because it is regulatory kind of stuff but NRCS is not regulatory and that's we want to make that clear too. Carolyn will you um, oversee the be the MC for the yes I, I can introduce I mean well I want Pete to introduce um, Mark and 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 then, but I, I can open the meeting, certainly. Can you maybe say something at the outset about the, the forum being sponsored by the MVP, MVP Pro? Program? Yes. Because I think that might be good for our, our brand here a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Okay. I, th I think that um, is really exciting, the fact that we're just aware of, you know, all the flooding that's happened in the farm lands right up through the week before Christmas and, and how important this is. So this is good. Okay. Any other thoughts about how to get the word out besides what we've talked about? Um, the only the only thing I was thinking of is because farmers rent a lot of property. So, um, Henry, if there's a lot of landowners that or any landowners that you're aware of that are farmers rent land from, mm -hmm. can you make sure that they hear about yeah. it too? Yeah. 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 Okay. I think yeah, I mean that's that's why I was so that's why I was so pleased to see that that was included on there as well as um, because that's that's a big portion of you know farming in general. You know, not all farmers own all their land, so having that and having farmers and possibly their land, landowners in the same meeting, listening to it, you know, hearing it from the same mouth at the same time, you know, and moving forward from that, I think is valuable. So yeah, I'll definitely perfect. see what I can do. Yeah, perfect. I'm happy to reach out to Chris Larrabee as well about seeing if it can be advertised in the recorder. Oh, great. Oh, Chris, that would be Thank great. You. Um, and Emma, did you get your question answered about CISA participation? I, I'm going to reach out to them. I'm going to reach out to CISA. I'll, I'll talk to Claire um, tomorrow. And uh, put something on their website, and hopefully, yeah, I'll get them to do it, and then maybe they'll send a representative too, just yeah. so as another contact, because they do a lot of the same kind of work. All right. Any thought? I, I, I'm sorry. I uh, just had a thought come to mind, but like a quick notice to put up, uh, you know, the coffee shops, and you know, you know what well, we could print they, out. We could print this out and just. Yeah. Farmer co-op, uh, you know, different places around. Yeah, that's a really good idea. We can put it, at, you know, send it up to the Greenfield cooperative there. You know, the Agway. Well, we they're no longer Agway, but yeah. you know, the Greenfield <laughs> co-op, farmers co-op up, oh, yeah. up in, in Greenfield. Greenfield, and you know, for people who go to get coffee or you know, bittersweet stuff, stuff like that. Yeah, that's right, a good my marketing background that comes through. <laughs> that that's really actually a good idea. We'll do that. We'll run some color copies and get it out. Uh, where else should we put it? The, the fertilizer company here in town or the... Yeah, I mean, we, we could see if they, I don't know if they've got like a place to really display it, but uh, I definitely know a lot of farmers go to Chadwick's Market. Yeah, that's that's, that's a good stuff. idea. Yeah. What about the Polish club? And yeah. Polish club. Yeah. Club, yeah, yeah there's no there's a... Yeah. <clears throat> BBA, yeah. BBA, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we we'll print up a bunch of them and and people can just okay. we'll we'll get them hung up. I'll I'll follow up on that part of it. Okay, great. Okay, uh, 
So moving along, um, we have our third session of uh, videos. This this time it's on uh, community climate resilience, and I hope everybody had a chance to watch that and check it out. We have only four questions we have to respond to about this one, so it'll be shorter than the previous time. But just to you know, quickly kind of recap. Um, that video was um, primarily about community examples of building community climate resilience. And they they gave uh, examples from Springfield where they were doing outreach to underserved residents, um, Mashpee where they were doing some stormwater remediation um, from for a pond there, uh, Chester, Massachusetts, where they were doing uh, work on resilient dirt roads, Andover. Uh, Shushkin River, Andover, Mass. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I lived there. Oh, really? I did. Grew up there. Would you like to say something about that? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Was it traumatic? No. Huh. Sorry. So they had uh, um, river flooding issues, and they um, did a, some work to get student and student engagement in their project, and did a climate summit, kind of like what we did here. And then Clinton, Massachusetts, did some uh, restoration of natural communities. So with that in mind, the four questions that we're supposed to have a group discussion and dialogue about, uh, starting up with this. Um, the case studies highlighted different types of projects. For example, Andover was assessing design solutions to prevent flooding. P developed new regulations to protect water quality, while Springfield focused on better communication and economic opportunities for its residents. What parts of those projects felt particularly exciting or meaningful to you? Why is that? What did those stories make you think about in the context of your own community? And is this type of work already underway in your community? So any thoughts about that? I have some. Go ahead. So big surprise. Actually, I I looked at all of them. I mean, I didn't read every single word, but three of them stood out. And one was I don't remember where it was, but it was um, buffer, but better your buffer. I don't know something like that. Riverfront project, and I thought that was interesting because it's saying remove pavement, also bike paths, and I was thinking about the Bloody Brook. So. My, my thoughts were more of a combination of a number of them. It wasn't any one that stood out. The other one was convert impervious, impervious surface to green space. That was another project. And the other one is um, pursuing resilient and equitable power. So I think, oh, and that's where the solar power comes in, which was interesting. It's um, the first paragraph, the project description says, solar power coupled with battery storage as a community used power solution. Um, but we don't have, oh, the only caveat with that is that we don't have an environmental justice population. I mean, per se, so I know that we've got a little bit, but anyway, so those are the three and I thought it's not just one of them, but it was a combination of a couple of them that could be really interesting. So those are my thoughts. Well, I had a lot of thoughts and, and, and I made Chris put it on the agenda, uh, you know, as a follow-up thing that we could do, but we don't have identified, we do have social justice um, community in here, in the South Deerfield village. We've already decided that, you know, our vulnerable population is, is more in the village and we, and that, you know, really subject to a lot of flooding. So, what made me, when I was reading through all these projects, what made me think about stuff was, you know, somehow we've got to activate the neighborhoods down here to participate because it doesn't do any good for us to, you know, well, in the campus, we're going to, you know, improve the bloody brook. We're going to take away some of the asphalt. We're going to have a walking path. We're going to have a buffer, native plant buffer. We're going to, we're going to do a lot of stuff that's upgrading and we're putting in storage, um, flood storage capacity at Leary Lot in under the parking lot, hopefully at the library parking lot. But we are doing that as people that don't necessarily, that don't live downtown. I mean, sort of you do, MA, but we don't live downtown. And somehow we've got to bring people downtown here involved. 
And so my thought was potentially to do some training in in the in the late spring or early spring before people get sidetracked with going out in their yard. And like I sort of did for our volunteers, EDS volunteers, was to do the ICS training and activate people to participate. And we would actually target people in the sense that we would at, invite them to participate in, tr in volunteer training and become trained volunteers and then help us manage volunteers in a disaster. And then also set up a sort of a FEMA, I don't wanna say FEMA, cause I was gonna actually, one of the persons I was gonna get was Peter Thomas, but um, you know, set up a recovery team that would help if, if, if we had inundation down here, help people file claims for FEMA. And it's silly things like, do you have your latest utility bill? You Before the FEMA will even open a, a an account for you or a loss claim for you, you gotta prove that you live there. And what do you show to prove that you live there? You show your utility bill. So do you have your last electric bill or your Comcast bill to show that you do actually live there to open an account. So the idea is to do some kind of training with these volunteers so that if we had that terrible rainstorm at the north end of town, just a couple miles south, and everybody had these terrible losses, we would have the ability to respond in an orderly manner. And that was sort of what I thought of when I was looking at these projects it was like oh we're doing a lot of this stuff ourselves you know pieces of it like denise said but that's what sprung to my mind that we're we need to go the next step hey carolyn i have a question is is social justice the same as environmental justice no okay. not not by definition of the state okay all right um i can't i have to look it up by the state that you know maybe chris chris could you look up what the state definition is for social justice and then environmental justice. So I know that the state has very specific criteria and I'm looking it up right now, but um, they have very specific criteria for defining environmental justice. Um, I don't know if they have a specific definition of social justice. It's more of a, a, a movement in and of itself rather than well, something that's, that's specific and you. legislated. We're appealing what they that we're not a social justice community, but well, I, Carolyn, I don't, I don't think the state designates social justice communities. They, they designate environmental I justice community. Yeah, yeah. It is. right. And we don't have an area, and so that's what, what Chris is working on is trying to come up with an area, which is hopefully the same. Well, that's for social justice. Is my question is, is it the same as environmental justice? No. So that's is that's what they're talking about here: environmental justice, not social justice. In, in the one that I was talking about. Well, environmental justice is that you live in a place that is more subject to, you're gonna be more subject to climate change than somebody else, and which is really true. This village is more subject to flooding than say, West Deerfield, okay? Where you live and where I live, we're not gonna get flooded out. If we get flooded out, then well, that's true, but that was not the case with Pine Nook. So yeah, I, I think that argument may be. People's houses weren't inundated. The road was inundated. Anyway. Yeah, I know. So just to clarify a little bit based on my understanding, environmental justice um, is largely reflective of people's ability to <laughs> adapt to the effects of climate change, which um, it's not necessarily tied to location as much as it is to socioeconomic factors. For instance, uh, English language proficiency is a major one. Um, and that's one of the determining factors in deciding an environmental justice community. Um, because people who don't have English language proficiency might have a harder time receiving communications when there's an emergency. Um, they might have a harder time working with emergency responders, for instance. Um, that's just one of them. Um, poverty is another one. People who have a lot of wealth are going to more easily be able to build back from a disaster event, whereas people who are below the poverty line are obviously going to have a much harder time with that. Um, and then when it comes to matters of race, that's just a legacy of our country's very messed up history of 
putting people who look a different way into certain segregated areas. So that kind of ties into the other factors very well. Um, and that's just the way that the state defines environmental justice is largely tied in with social justice, but it's not, they're not one in the same. And I, I don't want us to be giving anybody the impression that the state has social justice parameters that we don't meet. The state has environmental justice parameters that we come close to meeting and we're confirming some numbers and I've been doing some research on the American Community Survey um, that might be able to inform us on when we could receive an update to see if things have changed at all. But um, yeah, as for right now, I just wanted to give that update. That's what made me, that's what made me think of the right, kind of a recovery team kind of thing, because it's, it's people, people have the access to computers, they have the access for documentation, they have homeowners insurance, and they have money in the bank to be able to recover from flooding. But we know that there are going to be people that are going to have different abilities to respond from our center village. And, and so that's why I was thinking it was something that we should pursue as a social justice thing or environmental justice, however you define it. Any other thoughts about the first question? All right, question two. The MVP 2.0 process focuses on input from the broader community and specifically people who will be most impacted by climate change. Therefore, inclusive and equitable engagement will be key. What stood out to you in how these communities engaged and collaborated with community members? Why is that? What did those stories make you think about in the context of your own community? See, by watching those videos, what I thought was like, oh my gosh, how are we going to handle, how is this community going to handle twice as much water as we already got this past year? And that's what made me think of this stuff. <laughs> okay. I, I guess I'm confused. So, so as we're going through this, we're looking at looking at what some of the other towns have done and what might spark an interest in us. And that's what, you know, that's why I chose some of those, like reducing some of the pavement, getting a little more green space. Right. So is that what we're trying to do by having this discussion, sort of figure that out like this, or or this is then, you know, bringing in the rest of the community to help us determine that? Well, we're we're participating. You are chair of the CCI and the planning board, and you know the campus project is doing all these things. Right. Okay. Right. We're actively pursuing grants to improve all these things, but we're doing it and we're not bringing in the community. And that was why I was thinking if we did some kind of training, emergency, like 101 training, you know, mm -hmm. 101 ICS 100 training or something, we, we could come up with something that we would draw people in and they would see that this is how they could participate and how they could prepare for an emergency because in the next 30 years, we're going to have twice as much water. And how do, how in the heck could we handle twice as much water? Let's be just a, a thought. I was watching the video, and I think it was the administrator from Cheshire, a little town up on the hills. I know it really well. And, you know, what he said, and it's like, how do you brought, bring people into it? He had to go door to door. He talked to people. And that's the whole thing that I've always been. <clears throat> Uh, proponent of overall my lifespan and in, in, uh, of uh, in work and stuff is they have to talk to people. So sometimes we have to not sit here in the in the uh, you know our agendas, but get out and talk to people and knock on doors and, and see people. And I thought he just made a lot of a lot of good points there because very small town, obviously similar to this, a little bit smaller, but you got to go talk to people. Yeah, and that that's what made me think right we could get some people. And we talked we talked about that last time. You know, we have we have discussed that. So who are some of the um, who are some of the community members? For instance, the different clubs, like people who congregate at the Polish Club or the Women's Club or the Library. You know, so I mean, it's senior center, senior center, and I mean that's that's a really good start reaching out. So then it just comes back to what are we asking? What's the message? And then you know, setting yeah. up some time. We talked about this last time and talking about a timeline. When do we want to do this? And working back, right? Yeah. Okay. Or did I just dream that? No, no, no. I 
I, I'm not trying to complicate stuff, but this is what struck me is how we have got to pull in people yep. that are going to be effective. And the way you got to do that is you got to give them incentive to participate. And the incentive to participate would be this is going to help you when we have flooding. It's not are we going to have flooding? It's when we have flooding. Your house is going to be flooded, and this is how we can help you prepare. And it might not happen for a while, but whatever. Um, one of the things that always comes up in all meetings is the poor communication that we have in town. And so maybe as part sort of spinning off of what you are talking about, yes, door to door, but could we come up with a more permanent or more uh, a system of, of being able to communicate with people? I don't know how 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 we do that, but other towns must have done it. And and Deerfield, I mean, I this has been an issue since ever since I moved here. Is how do you communicate with people in town? So how do you even you know get somebody to come to a meeting? How do you get how, you know how do what's the system? There must be best practices someplace in for small towns for doing well, this. Tim has been working on trying to figure out communication because I don't think we should underestimate the the uniqueness of Deerfield and people not knowing what's going on. Part of it is if you don't have any interest in an issue, you're not inclined to find out about it. And if you care about it, that's all you're going to focus on. So we've had a, you know, a TED talk discussion of in public of that in the last two weeks, people who don't want to pay for the roads have been doing one thing and people who do have been doing a different thing. So it's difficult. Um, I think Pete's correct. You know, maybe we, if we're trying to address a specific group, then we go out and try to meet with them, you know, not in necessarily an organized group, but individually. Yeah, I, and I was saying either individually, but I think Denise had some ideas too of like, you know, the various groups of senior center went and because, you know, I'm still trying to figure out what MVP actually means, you know, and I'm on the committee. So who else out there understands what we're doing? So you have to go out there because yeah. then they if they, they'll make an opinion, I'm either for or against, because yeah. they know about it. Right. If they have no idea what it is, like I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, and we don't, you know, we need to get that message out. So it's a whole educational Exactly. Part of it to start with, and the education comes from a communication uh, process. Mm -hmm. so. Well, something else we can get it out in the schools. You just have to get in touch with the superintendent with Darius. You have flyers, and they will they'll distribute them throughout the school system. So, so. The, the problem is, um, you know, we have so much school choice. Like the frontier is forty percent school choice, so that you don't even have, you know, local kids. I don't, uh, well, maybe that's a good, you know, public outreach to the, you know, people in Waitley who have an MVP group, you know, it's, it's a side benefit for them, you know, yeah. send their yeah. kid home with an MVP pat handout and, uh, yeah. and their parents get interested and they start paying attention in their town. Um, Cause we're all neighbors. Yeah. And one of the, on the speakers of the, the video was saying, you know, you can look at regional approaches to these aspects as well so maybe that's maybe kind of that's a too. really good thing maybe we could do it a four town regional yeah um communication kind of you know i know there's yeah. a lot of school choice in from mohawk and different areas greenfield but you know you still get education out there and you get the communication started yeah but one of the biggest problems with bloody brook is is the water goes down to waitley swamp and it just sits yeah. there so working with um waitley mvp would make sense you know, maybe there's something we can do with Waitley. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we have the, the women's club, you know. Um, they tend to be engaged people. So um, some outreach to them, you know, they'll bring it home to their house. Um, so who's going to head up this? And that was the other thing, is, you know, almost sort of. A, a bad word here, but what's the message? <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, well, we have to figure out what the message is before you start. Doing well, it. since exactly. it, I was talking talking about the recovery kind of program, a team, or you know, have people draw people in to to find out so that they're at least aware of how vulnerable they are in the future. I mean, I I think that's number one. You got to educate 
people that, you know, we're doing everything we can to mitigate the flooding issue, but there is going to be a flooding issue with the Bloody Brook right through the center of our town. So, but I was going to reach out to um, Peter Thomas um, as a retired FEMA person and, and see, just talk to him for a while. So I, I don't mind volunteering to do that as a next step and seeing what um, materials FEMA would be willing or what access we had to some materials that are already pre-done. You don't want to reinvent the wheel. And and this was just an idea I had talked to, to Chris about. And I so I will put some, I will invest more time in it between now and our next meeting to try to figure out what that really, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, Carolyn, I'm thinking, you know, we're t trying to reach out to people, but it sounds like, you know, as you said, we're already in the thick of it. We sort of know some of the issues. So when I've done things before, it's like you, you get a, you have a focus group and none of us would be there. We'd have an uninterested party, disinterested party who would actually run the focus group. So you don't, so you don't sway people's opinions. And then you talk about, um, you know, you just have a, a thing of questions, a, a, a sheet of questions about, um, what does climate change mean to you? How do you think it affects your community? So that kind of thing. And then after that, then you have a discussion. So mm -hmm. it's not like we're leading them saying, it's like we're wanting them to say what we already know. Right. No, that and that's right. fine, Denise. That's true. Yeah, no, that's yeah. that's good. Is it, part of this is coming from um, the shock of me during the pandemic when I was doing um, contact calling for the pandemic, it, it just amazed me the number of people that we had to deliver groceries to because they, they just didn't have a lot of groceries in the pantry. And it, people, and it, it, it wasn't necessarily a money issue. It was just people order out a lot more and, and they just don't have stuff that they can just stay home for. And, and, and so I think there's an, People haven't given much thought to this whole, what if you're flooded and, you, and your house is devastated? What are you gonna do? And, and it's overwhelming. And so I think if we could come up with a game plan of sorts and, and in, enroll people in that, that might be a kind of a good idea. But anyway, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm just looking at this and I'm thinking I got a six o'clock meeting right where I'm sitting. I know. need to move along. I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. Me so too. we will move along. I just wanted to mention though that part of the reason we're having these discussions is that it kind of leads us to what we're gonna do in the second half of this MVP 2.0 where we have another big slug of state funding and we can actually do some of these things that we're talking about. So so there is a purpose to all of this and I think we're, we're getting to some good ideas here that are important. So, uh, so, Henry, I wanted to ask you a question. Yeah. Um, was, you know, I've been so focused on damaged roads that I've, I've watched the videos, but I don't have a very good memory of what happened. Were, were there any things, Denise, anyone um, that were specific? I, when we had our last meeting, Henry, I think you mentioned erosion. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I don't know if any of the communities that I've forgotten everything that I saw. Yeah. Um, was there anything that related to, like when I drive by to, go over to Stillwater. Right. Um, I see, I think that's your family's yeah. land where yep. the, the, there's a stream that runs yep. down to the deer field. I don't know if it's Bloody Brook yeah. or what it is. No, that's, uh, I don't know. I don't know the, the correct name of that brook. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and I know that, you know, your land is is subject to the erosion mm -hmm. there. And uh, so is that some, you know, something that any of the other communities I mean, yep, as, far, as far as I, I, erosion related to ag, I didn't, I didn't really yeah. hear much of it. I mean, those communities They're aren't really, really agricultural ag, yeah, exactly. communities, but I mean, um, I'm sure that there are somewhere that, um, and I mean, that is such a huge part of our community and it's not just the farmers, but you know, everybody, you know, you don't really want, I know for an example, um, on Mill Village Road, if you're headed, if you're headed north, we have a piece of land that previously actually wasn't owned by us, but we recently purchased it. And there was a lot of issues with erosion into onto Mill Village Road. No one wants yep. to drive over the dirt, you know? Yep. And then, you know, maybe if we had um, some resources to properly ditch the swamp that was backing up, 
yeah. um, possibly tile the field so that the water would run and not take the topsoil with it. Right. Um, I think that, you know, that would benefit everyone, not just the farmer that's losing from the erosion. Right. You know, and then the road, you know, that culvert that goes under the road, it's, I'm sure mostly full and that just, it, it's, it's hard. You know? yeah. It saves the town, it saves the town money too, because they're all, they're all the time trying to redigging. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not necessarily yeah. helping, and but I like think there's like the correct that. way to do it, yeah. you know, right. um, instead of just sort of being behind the eight ball all the time. And exactly with a, with a hard year also comes not being up to par on your farming practices, too, just because you're always having to deal with the weather. You're yeah. not where you want to be at the right time. But mm. it'd be Tim, curious to see, you know. Tim, was part of your question, did that pertain to the, 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 um, what we what we read in here yeah one of them was yeah it's called better your buffer <laughs> oh yeah river, river fund yeah. project and in that i mean i just took a few notes yeah. and part of it was removing pavement which is a big problem and then um that's that's what made me think about the bloody brook right so you know we could go back and look at that case it's kind of expanded because i think one of the i know one or two of the fields that you your family recently acquired you seem to be keeping them in, in hay and stuff. Yeah, well, that was... The, so that it's was, more permanent, whereas right. if you're farming potatoes and you and you farm corn and you dig it up all the time. Yeah, well, that's that was yeah. one of the reasons there, but it, it's it happens, you know, still regardless, and it's just, you know, it's hard for us to necessarily... Well, A, it's possibly not in our realm of what we can do is right. have that drain properly away from the road, you know, because that is a swamp there, and by yeah. no means do we want to... You know, we don't want to really encroach on that, but right. you know, if it's affecting the community because people are, you know, having yeah. to drive through water all the time, we're, you know, what? but that's a fantastic thing to focus on as a project. Right. Uh, that's a identifiable yeah. project mm -hmm. that the town can cooperate with you right. and NRCS mm -hmm. and come up with a solution. Right. And yeah. that, uh, you know, yeah, because it slopes down mm -hmm. towards the swamp. Yeah. The road yeah. is there; it's washing out on the road, but your topsoil. Is going into the swamp, right, which is right. not where it should be. Right. Well, that's that's what that's what seeding that to hay was trying to prevent. Right. Because you know that's out of the crops we grow the best to hold in the soil. So right. that's was the thought there. But there still is topsoil there, and there's still topsoil in that culvert, and there's also topsoil from the field to the left. Yeah. Right. You know, and erosion will happen as, as well as you do your farming practices. Kind of a fact of the if matter. Have, if you have a hill. Yes. <laughs> and if you get thirty inches of rain in a month. Yeah. 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 But, but the other yeah. side of the river, on my side, on Lower Road, if we could look out of our window and the river had totally flooded Savage's fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and, and those banks are pretty steep too. Right. So yeah. I don't know how much you could actually increase, you know, right. along the banks. Right. I think right. it's a little yeah. different story. Yeah. I know I did the same thing that I just uh, reminded Carolyn about. So sorry. About that. <laughs> yes, um, so I'm going to move gonna on to bring us yeah. back to the agenda. <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. guilty. so we can get through this. Um, the third question that we need to answer is welcome, Lori. Glad you could make it. Um, many of the case studies um, didn't just protect against a climate hazard, but went further to transform ways of doing things in their community to build social resilience, restore environmental resources, and address root causes of vulnerability. Where do you see opportunities in your community to tackle community vulnerability while also creating a stronger and healthier community, healthier community in other ways at the same time? Did we already answer that? I yes. I, I mean, to, sit, to keep I think from so. repeating myself. Ask and answer. Henry just gave a great example of yes. a project yeah. over there. That yeah. 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 I, yeah, I feel like we have a cooperative project already. Yeah. Okay. So that gets us to question four. Just like the case study interviewees, take a moment to imagine your community in 50 years. What does it look like? Who's there? <laughs> what makes it a thriving place? That's a great one. Oh, yes, I'll answer that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. CeCe's not here. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I guess I just, I mean, I, I, I don't know what... The climate will look like in 50 years i mean there's predictions and and whatnot but i mean i just would hope that we would have we would continue to be proactive to what would be next you know you know there will still be challenges ahead of us at that point so you know just always staying ahead of the eight ball um just in terms of that and i i would hope that in those past the previous 50 years like i would hope that 
um, we would be able to come together as a community to make changes and to have sort of like the video sh video showed, like have a community that wants change in this realm and that will work together um, because it's going to affect everybody regardless of who you are, whether you think that projects or um, projects are right or wrong, it's going to affect you either way. So it, just having a community that I think has progressed from where it is today in terms of, in terms of that, or, and unfortunately, maybe that progression will be um, in, in, uh, from force and not choice, unfortunately, you know, that, that, that progression might have to come as a reaction, not as a um, proactive measure, but. But you just make me think, Henry, back yeah. to the question one, yeah. for things we had about communication and education. Right. It's gotta start now with little kids. And, right. You know, they're going to be around in 50 right. years. Yeah. And what do they think about climate, yeah. actually, yeah. acclimatization and different mm -hmm. things? You know, it's, you know, I'll be 135 then or whatever, you know, not going to be my problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. You got to start with it. Yeah. In the next generation. I, I just, yeah. I just think a community that would work together um, on, or a community that has worked together and a community that will work together in the future. And that's, I think, what, you know, as a town, what I think the right place to be at would be then. Um, what's the word vision as part of the question? Because, um, yes. Because I, I would like to think, and I think that starts now, that um, we are a vibrant agricultural community still. Mm -hmm. And I think that the one thing I got out of the pandemic is, oh my gosh, I could walk to Atlas Farm. I don't have to worry if the shelves are bare. You know, I can go down the street to whatever farm stand. So I I don't know how, um, I mean, this is not a how, but, you know, to to get our young kids to really value our farm, some kind of local farm tour, some involvement, whatever. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of people really value our farms, but I'm not sure that the people that will be our age in 50 years, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah, is definitely, I definitely think that's important. I mean, that's, that's more of what I see, you know, I had something, a vision, you know, for myself just to be, you know, make sure that farmers are still, um, thriving you know but um yeah it is interesting like, making sure that people younger than me and people younger to come will see that necessity in our community because mm -hmm. i do think it is it's, it's a necessity and i mean it's you know who takes care of the land and you know who secures one family. of the good things about having so much apr land some people don't think it's a good thing but as climate changes you adapt the uses of the land to what the climate is dealing you. And I don't know if the young kids, I don't know about 4-H and all those things, if that's even that active anymore, but I know that there are us there oldsters kids. had a connection because early jobs were in working on farms, you know, mm -hmm. here, you know, cucumbers, tobacco. Um, I don't know how vibrant is that Henry anymore. I, I mean, I, I, I always had friends that would help out, but I definitely think the days of like, you know, having 20 kids just like want to spend their summer on the farm. I, I don't necessarily see that anymore. You know, I feel, especially the farms that don't have someone my age, you know, I was able to bring people my age there because they're my friends, but a farm that maybe they don't have someone that's in school or, you know, they don't have a connection. I, I don't see kids necessarily going out and reaching out, you know, is, is gaining experience, right. you know, I, which is kind of sad, which is sad to me. I mean, my the family one... raves about that pretty Go ahead. About Go ahead. not having the old summer job how do we recreate that yeah that you know that kids feel needed by the community in some way or another i mean they seem to be able to i don't know what the answer to that i think it's a huge yeah. question well this one of the reasons i've been so active on um the conservation district and then the mass association of conservation districts is because one of the things that has always bothered me is that kids, just from a stewardship point of view, don't even get outside anymore. They're on their phones so much. And 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 I understand you got mosquitoes, you got ticks. None of those things existed, you know, in my kids' generation. I live in the same house. There were mosquitoes. Yes, <laughs> but not disease-related mosquitoes. <laughs> but, but listen, you know, in my own home, 
we were out in the yard, my kids were outside all the time. My, my took, grandkids in the same yard go outside and then they have to do tick checks because there's so many ticks in the woods. And and so and then the repercussions of having your kid have a tick bite and stuff. So th so there's parents today are a lot less willing to let kids go outside and participate in the outside because there are danger. And and so stewardship has always been an issue. And one of the things that is um, a virus on where the kids are involved in school, having a team and answering serious community issues based on water or soil quality and all that kind of stuff is really important. So I think one of the things we can do is just help and support Stacy. Chapley at Frontier to create a Navirathon team um, at Frontier as one of our goals. And, and the conservation district is willing, we don't have hardly any money, but we could put up a little bit of money as a stipend for um, some of the, you know, you have transportation costs and stuff to compete nationally. But what's so exciting is Massachusetts has won the national and the international uh, award for Envirothon two years in a row. It's Lexington, you know, and they've had a strong program they've had for years and they have, you know, wicked, well subsidized public school, but they compete nationally and our team from Massachusetts has been number one. And I feel that if we had more participation, you don't have much participation from the western part of the state and part of it is it, you have to have somebody like Stacy who's motivated, um, you know, a local person who is science-based kind of and works with kids. No, Carolyn, I think that's great that she's doing that, but I think it would be worthwhile to maybe ask the curriculum coordinator to come to a meeting to talk about what's actually ta being taught in the elementary school and then how does it continue on to middle school and high school? And if it's not, maybe it should. It should. Actually, so so I think that would be an interesting well, conversation instead of just tar targeting one teacher who is already doing something, because if she's no longer there, then what happens? Well, I've, I've tried to, you know, unfortunately, the schools are, are mandated with the MCAS tests, and hopefully they're going to go out the door. But but mm -hmm. I, one of the committees that I was on, the National Association of Conservation District Committees, was the Education Committee. And we had curriculum for pollinators, curriculum for lawns and stuff like that. It's on the national uh, NACD website. And I was, I've tried several times to get it in the elementary school and we had some teachers that were really interested, but they just don't have time, you know, because it's mandated with the MCAS. It's really hard. You know, Lori, Lori can address but After that. MCAS in June is open season. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just wondering if we can, um, you know, maybe kickstart some kind of connection between one of the local environmental organizations and the elementary school where they take a field trip to um, Hitchcock Center or, and, you know, if we get the teachers, you know, that's usually a, a low stress thing for a teacher because it's all packaged and ready for them or, you know, having the people come here, um, I don't know. But I, I definitely think we should have some kind of ongoing valuing Deerfield kind of program. I, um, I do too. Is there I, any, is there any, um, I guess, well, Greenfield has the just roots. I don't know that that's something that we would want to replicate in Deerfield or whether it would have any value. Just roots, it's, it's um, what used Deerfield. to be called the community farm. So like eight acres or less, I, it's not... They've got like two acres or three acres under cultivation. They put Indi up solar at one point. Yeah. Like they were talking about yeah. putting up and solar. individuals can go and farm there. And so they have Grace, a school program. Yeah. And yeah. so if we had something similar here for, you know, DES or for Frontier. I don't know whether it's something that there's enough interest in. But again, that's something could be answered if you had, you know, as Denise suggested, not just one teacher, but, you know. Also kids, gr kids growing food. And yeah. be it being part of the of the school lunch program, yeah. and you know, bringing you know, getting Hall, out. Hall There's Mott tons a, of best practices of those kinds of things. I was things. just going to say, Hallmont has um, elementary school has a really good program, and we went up there as a conservation district and did pollinator education up there. Yeah. So it, it is really cool. Henry, unfortunately, Hallmont may be 
going out of uh, out of the district there pretty soon because I know the, the woman, a friend of mine that started that whole uh, farming thing there, Jeannie, and uh, it was a great process, but it was from the curriculum, you know, the administrator down, everything was, you know, that kind of agricultural. And I think there's another area, it's a private room up in Ashfield. Um, one of the veterinarians was telling me about it, mm -hmm. bringing a lot of um, kids from city areas mm -hmm. to work for two, three, four weeks or so. And, and like, fresh apparently, fresh start, apparently that's yeah. like thriving. They, they, yeah. they have to, they're building more and more yeah. dormitories and things. For, for the, the city kids. Yeah. But I think we can sit here talking about this all day, but I think it's probably, it would be, I mean, we can decide what we want, but why don't we, why don't we talk to the curriculum coordinator, talk to someone. When the kids, my kids were in elementary school, Doug Tierney, I have to say was, he was so supportive of the arts. So one whole year we had, um, through the arts partnership, we had art about science, science about art and the integration and all the teachers integrated that into their curriculum. And it was a really exciting year. Teachers were really pumped. The kids loved it. So it is possible to do that. Maybe so. um, maybe a project would be to bring MVP and a school curriculum discussion yeah. together about, because look, even if you're not farming, weather, climate change and weather change is going to be part of your life every day of your life. So, um, you know, and that's just so everybody knows we did get an mvp grant and we did develop an, a climate-based curriculum for the frontier middle and high schools which i coordinated um and we did that over a two-year period and it was done with like three or four different class levels um and then this year we're i'm going to be working with some fifth grade teachers at des um, on a similar kind of thing but you know obviously for the fifth grade level so it's not that we're not working in the schools. We, we have stuff going on already, but I think these are great ideas and, and I'm definitely taking note of them. Could be a, a good potential project for us uh, going forward in the second half. So I'm gonna just try to bring us back to the agenda here, if that's okay, um, Tim. No, no. Okay. So we've finished now the first wave of, of trainings, which were the you know ones that you could do at home. Um, there's a second wave of trainings that um, are also is also a three part um, training, and in this case, it's a scheduled training that's on a statewide basis. And there are different um, sets of dates that we need to either sign up for or register for uh, as a group. So there are there are three training waves. Those are in the agenda. If you have it in front of you, training wave one is probably too soon for us because it starts on January 23rd. Um, and we still have um, have a meeting scheduled for January, but we already have that date kind of booked. So it's all three of the days? Right? All three of the days, yeah. So and January 23rd, January 30th, and February 6th. Full day? No. Um, pick one of those dates? No, we, 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 have, we have to pick one of the waves. One. So it's a wave of three meetings. Does that make sense? So training wave one might be a little early. Training wave two, I think, is probably the one we want, which is February 5th, 12th, and 19th. Oh, March. March. No, March. March. Sorry. It's March 12th and 19th. You know, that would work. And it also would work with CeCe's um, vacation schedule, too. Um, well, and we do that all together? In other words, yes. we that is our meeting? Yes. Right. Yeah. Kind of takes the place of any other. Gotcha. Yeah. But there, you know, it's it's once a week for three weeks straight. How long do they take? Uh -oh. Oh, it's just here. It's not, the state isn't running it. The state is running it. Oh, We would watch video. it on video, but oh, we do it as a group together. together. It's kind of an assigned slot that we get. Do you know what time it is? They haven't told us really, but I'm guessing it's probably about the same as those other um, videos. They were pretty, they were pretty short. Some of them were, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking like an hour, but you know, they really haven't been very specific about it so far. Do we, far. Choose a time? Do we know what? I'm sorry. Do you get to choose a time? Do we have any opinion? Um, time of day? Yeah. I don't think so. Okay. I think it's I think it's a state program uh, deal. Well, yeah. Is, is this is this synchronous or asynchronous? 
Meaning, do you have to do it at a certain time? I mean, or yes, it, I think we have to do it time. at a specific time and a specific date, uh, is my understanding. So, but you don't know the time. They haven't told us that yet. Oh, and I guess okay. nor how long. I don't to... If it is any idea, if it maybe could ask if it would be recorded, if somebody's absent, <laughs> they can watch it. You know what? Uh, I think yeah. let's sign up for training wave two. Yeah, okay. and then we'll have Chris. No and figure out how we can tape it if people can't make it because who knows i mean they don't give us a time yeah. i mean yeah. i have homeland security on the 5th and the 19th but i mean those are my standing meetings where's our person yeah so worst case scenario if uh we're not allowed to record it at all i can take really good notes and share them with whoever's absent so let's sign up and yeah. hope that all of us can try to, and many of us as can. I mean, who knows? And then, um, is there a theme for those? Is it a? Th do we know what it's even about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm giving you pretty much the information that we have so far. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry. But, you yeah. know what? This is what happens when you are the leading edge of. of <laughs> They don't even give you times. They just say the day. I'm, I'm calling something else. Yeah, I know, Denise. I know. We're on, we're on tape and we're being polite. So don't say anything. Um, All right. Okay. I agree. So there Sign up for wave two and, yeah. and whatever happens, happens. Okay. Yeah. That, <laughs> that I know. I'm, I'm putting it in. Okay, great. Well, Before we move on, can I just ask um, does anybody have an update on the prospective 10th member at all? I know we're still waiting on a, a liaison for low income slash uh, mobility challenged yeah, residents. I'm sorry, I, I, I think I gave Carolyn an update and I failed to give you an update, but I, I reached out to our two potential candidates, whom was um, Carlos, who is the crossing guard at Deerfield Elementary. And then the second person Bill. was Bill. Um. Glen Carge or something like that. Yeah. Sorry. I don't know. Um, sorry for mispronouncing your name, Bill. Um, neither of those folks seem to be willing to participate. Um, so we do not have that slot filled and still would love to have somebody. Um, yes, uh, I you know I've I've run this by folks at the senior center and uh, they didn't respond with any suggestions. I ran it by the town nurse who gave me Mr. Karj. Um, I don't I don't know if anybody has any suggestions um, Wait, beyond looking that. For looking for someone to represent um, kind of the underserved, underrepresented part of town that people that who don't participate a lot in in these kinds of committees, but particularly the folks along Bloody Brook who are impacted by flooding might be, you know, perhaps, you know, more impacted economically than others. If you can think of anyone like that, even friends or neighbors that might be likely candidates, it'd be really great if we could fill that. So not just a person who gets a flooded basement all the time, but- Well, that'd be fine if we could find somebody. <laughs> There is a payment for participating. Yes. So if, if someone wants to, yeah, we can, we can, there is some uh, ability to fund that. Yeah. So give it some thought. If you, if you know somebody that is a good possibility, please email me or suggest. Here's another, here's another question that you probably don't have the answer to. Um, if we signed up for wave one and then we changed our mind, would they let us out of wave one? Because the only way we're going to find out when this is going to happen is to <laughs> sign up, find out when they're going to offer this stuff. It's going to be the same it's like trials. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll call Andrew. All right. Get an answer to your question. Yeah. I know we're all three at once. See what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to you yeah. as soon as I can. But I think we should indicate that we'll sign up for wave two. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Right. And then just see what happens. Chris will do the best he can to make sure everyone's connected. Yeah. You know, Chris, so no one. Okay. So moving along. Uh, we have to take advantage of Henry because pretty soon Henry will be out straight. Yeah. 
the 19th is that should still be that should still be okay. Be, yeah. Getting close though. Yeah, getting, getting close. How high the snow is. Yeah. <laughs> um, so quick updates on the MVP action grants. Uh, all of the three projects are moving along. Uh, the construction of the green infrastructure uh, in historic Deerfield. Um, Berkshire Design is now on board. They've started working on getting that project ready for bidding. Uh, we have a ground penetrating radar scan that is supposed to be scheduled sometime in the next week or two, I think. Um, that's gonna help us to identify whether the location that we picked is gonna be problematic or not. Um, or there's any historic stuff underneath the ground that we don't know about. Um, that sort it of flooded thing. over the weekend. But I mean, the last day yeah, or two. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so historic Deerfield is really excited about this project. They can't wait to have it done. Um, just so everybody knows, there is real support for for is getting this kind of work. Similar to the ones here and yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Same basic concept. It's, a, it's at the. It's between the sidewalk and the street, and it puddles over into the sidewalk, so it always freezes and and is a mess on the sidewalk. Is so this the one that's going to go on the Champney side of the street? Or yeah. over yeah. where a lot of cars park yeah. towards yeah. the end yes, of parking it's, spaces. It's on the uh, west side of the street, right next to the Deerfield Inn, yeah. and yeah. just north of where the parking area for Deerfield Inn is. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. You know personally. Oh, no, I am. Yeah, absolutely. It's a mess. Blood's there. Yeah. We, Crazy. we went through a lot of different options to find that location. It's really tough to find a spot because there are all kinds of obstacles. Um, Deerfield Elementary School, we're doing green entryway for that. Um, Berkshire Design Group is also under contract now to do that work. Uh, we've had uh, a meeting recently with Darius Modesto to talk about the preliminary design plans and some of the issues there, and things are moving along really well with that. So I think we're, we're on target for that one. That one's um, planned for construction in um, mid-summer. And then the Leary lot, um, similar report, Berkshire Design's working on that. Uh, I think they're a little bit further along. And in, in the case of the Leary lot, I believe the final uh, documents and construction cost estimate have been um, presented to the town for approval prior to bidding. So we're getting ready to go out to bid. Is there any update, Chris, on your end on that? Uh, that's going to be bid ready within weeks. So that's uh, moving along. Hopefully an early springtime project for breaking ground and uh, we'll have a nice parking lot by the summer there with some great green space. It's really exciting. Any questions about any of those? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, just, I wonder about following up with, um, Can you talk to me? Uh, it was, um, there were two people at least on that street who offered to contribute to the picnic tables, that area. Yeah, I didn't want to have that totally get lost. Um, Gianni um, and I think we didn't, I'm not sure if we've- what, Once we get going, we're going to have a lot of excitement because Berkshire Brew is going to change around there um beer garden kind of approach to the to their place and so it's very exciting now what, what laurie's talking about is that when we wrote the grant application there was actually a cash contribution listed as part of our cash match for the grant which is very important because we have to document that so getting those businesses actually to make the contribution so we can buy the picnic tables etc yeah. um we should yep. follow up on that. Maybe you and I can talk about that offline a little oh, bit. Okay, and yeah, um, I think it would be great um, diplomatically too to kind of let them know about timeline and what to expect and the, you know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're gonna we do that as soon as we can. Did, did, I don't know what the turnout was because I didn't get yeah, to go to that meeting. Community forums, and I actually hand delivered flyers to every single business in oh. town, so they have been informed. Okay, and, and it's been well, you know. The information been well documented with, with all the businesses. Yeah, because I did hear. I think it was Pete that was saying the knocking on the doors, and um, you know it's time consuming, but I do think it is really important and worthwhile. So, 
No, I, I mentioned this at a previous meeting, but when I talked to the business owners, every single one of them was really excited about the Larry lot. Yeah. Some of them didn't know about it, amazingly, hmm. but they were really enthusiastic and um, glad to hear that it was happening. They put um, some you know, cash in for a picnic table or et cetera. Did they get their name on it? You know, donated by? Yeah, that's I think what, that's, that's what I told them. Yeah, I think, I think that's what they should get. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Promises have been made. And um, Hampshire Lumber said that they would actually supply the picnic tables, um, yeah. but it was an issue of design, you know, which ones, because they would supply wooden ones. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I just think we want, we want the people who are neighbors there to um, be caretakers of the green space. So the more buy-in, the better. So, yep. Good, good points. Okay. Uh, next item is um, initial discussion of MVP plan update and ideas for future MVP strategies. We don't have to do a lot on this today. And I know, you know, it's getting late and everybody's time sensitive here, but I wanted to just have this as a placeholder on the agenda. Maybe we can start the discussion a bit tonight, but really our, our overall goal of this process is to update the town's MVP plan and come up with a new set of strategies that we want to use for our, our, our prioritized list of projects that we want to apply for action grants for going forward. Um, so we have, again, some money in MVP 2.0 that we can spend, and then we, we have next the future rounds of action grants. And we want to be kind of set up at the end of all this with a really specific prioritized list of ideas about what's most important for the town to work on. And so I'm going to be gathering those ideas from all of the discussion that we've had at this meeting and other meetings um, and trying to put that in a format that you can kind of digest a little bit. One thing I wanted to, you know, bring up tonight, and, well, one thing that Carolyn's already brought up is this idea of a recovery team. We've kind of talked about that. So that was on the agenda. Um, I think that's a really good idea and could be an MVP funded project. The second one is, you know, this focus on Bloody Brook flooding. Um, the last big storm that we had, you know, just recently in December, I went out and took a look at Bloody Brook to try to you know, do some kind of on the ground assessment of where the flooding problem really was being caused. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about the railroad culvert being the, maybe the source of the problem. When I went out and looked at it, it looked to me like the problem was at Pleasant Street. Um, the culvert at Pleasant Street was really backing things up significantly. And the railroad culvert seemed to be flowing pretty well. And it's a much bigger culvert than the one at Pleasant Street. So I think we need to have somebody who's an engineer, and I am not, take a look at this issue a little bit more closely. But it, at a very minimum, I could go out and measure the culverts and see what the capacity is. That's a simple start. Um, but just eyeball test looked like Pleasant Street is a much smaller culvert um, than the railroad culvert. And, and clearly, the backup was happening right in that area. Um, and all of the, the the major flooding and deep water was was in that so section. Chris, were you, were you at the meeting last night? Were you at the informational meeting? No. Okay, because the chief did, did an amazing job, as did the select board, an amazing job. And what was really interesting is that a lot of the culverts, I mean, John was talking about one of the box culverts, the old box culverts that was typically made out of concrete or something and maybe collapsed 40, 50 years ago or something. And what they did originally... 40, 50 years ago, they would put, I think, a 50-inch pipe. But because it had collapsed, they didn't have the capacity, so then they put a 30-inch pipe. And that is why there's so many Wait, issues. Where is this? I don't know. He didn't, I don't remember the specifics. But all over town. Yeah. All they, over they did this repair oh, all over town. Denise, it's all over. Now yeah. they're putting in 60-inch pipes. So that, which is, which is better than 30 inches, certainly. So that's so that's really interesting to see what are the pipes and what's the what's the structure. And I mean, they're all old. So yeah, clearly we need to we need to replace them on an incremental basis as you know as as quickly as we can. <laughs> yeah. So this is like at yeah. Rick, at Richardson's, you know, there's there's a pipe under Wapping Road. Then then when it gets to the other side of Wapping, Wapping Road near Richardson's, and these are all like 48 or 60 inch culverts. Um, 
Yeah. Thirty-six and forty-eight and sixty. Yeah. Yeah, this whole uh, for the repair. Ago. This yeah. so it starts on whopping. We haven't had any problems. In and September it collects the water on whopping. In December, then it goes it across the on the whopping, uh, and that's the one coming from the whopping side. Uh, uh, well, from one side of whopping to the other, and it feeds in to this pipe, which also catch runoff from here. It's not Richardson's there. Richardson's is right over here. Yeah, yeah. that's the house next to it. Yeah, the so 60. it runs along and flows into uh, a big 60 inch culvert that then goes to the front of the Richardson's property. That ends up yeah. going through the MD uh, Mill and Village. Ends up on Route 5 and 10, and where we've dredged all the silt that's been building up for 30 years, 40 years. So there was no flooding. There was no flooding recently. You know, this whole rainstorm, snowstorm thing. Uh -huh. so the previous one, there was flooding on the lower field at DA. Yeah. The bridge went out, and that's all because we're trying to spend a lot of time in Wapping Road this year, um, and the water comes over. So there's constriction. There's a constriction by natural design over there. We've changed some of the culverts on the backside, but there's still areas. And, and I think Carolyn, some, is it um, Elfway's doing a study of Bloody Brook? Because, you know, Chris, you're right. The, those culverts are what you see as this is an issue. But you'd have to go, you want to start on Blaybrook, way up north. There's a beautiful swamp up there, beautiful wetland area, how to manage that, because that's total water storage, that's total flood control. And the problem with Bloody Brook kind of coming down Main Street, it's been channelized over the years. Mm -hmm. So the water just flows, flows, flows. And we got people's lawns going right down to the waterfront. There's no shrubbery in there. There's no way to pull back the water flow. We've been working on that when people you know, buy new places or whatever, but you, you need to do a, a larger kind of hyd hydrogeological view of Bloody Brook to figure out why this culvert is what it, it's probably filled with sediment, mm -hmm. but that sediment started at the top of North Main Street and it's flowed through there um, because it's so totally channelized and that all that sediment because of velocity of the water to it, it can keep running down through until it gets to a point where it's able to settle. And so it needs a little, it needs, you know, we can keep changing the culverts and removing the mm -hmm. the water down further. Um, and then it does just right out here, there's two beautiful little marshes too. There's two little swamps and marshes and shrub marshes and stuff behind the fields here that contain a lot, a lot of water. And then you have to look at those points, but there's some great swamps and there's some great, you know, flood collection areas there that you don't want to channel a lot of water through, you know, directly. Everybody wants to make a nice straight line of a, of a ditch, mm -hmm. if you will. And right. it's not the answer on yeah. how water wants to flow fast. Uh, yeah. and what is good for the yeah, environment right. and the wildlife in the area. And you want some of this to happen. You want some of this to go, but you, you need to take a look at, at, at the whole area and understand that the whole North Main Street is just straight channel water. The um Frank the FERCOG, uh, Franklin Regional Council of Governments yeah, is maybe. has a grant maybe. for doing a watershed study of the Bloody Brook. It's supposed the money runs out June thirtieth. They've been understaffed. They have promised us this report for months. Yeah. So hopefully that's going to happen. But this spring, the Franklin Conservation District has a small grant to hire at field geology um, is a fluvio geomorphologist, and it's how the river moves. And so um, we'll either have Nick or John Field come down, and they will walk the whole Bloody Brook through the town of Deerfield and give us some advice on what is the potential for the Bloody Brook moving and how it, as Pete said, it's very channelized. People put, you know, their rake leaves, they put sticks and trash in there, and, and not, not trash, but, you know, debris from their yards, they rake it right in. That's the kind of stuff that causes huge problems. And so hopefully between getting that watershed study that we can all read and try to figure out, and then having Nick, Nick is, or John are both, um, you can really yeah. experience it's it's um John Field and Nick Miller of Field Geology in um Portland, Maine, 
and they are fluvio-geomorphologists. And what they do is they study the river, movement of the river. We've been working with them for over 10 years, well, since Irene, um, on the Deerfield River and how to be proactive instead of always reactive. And, and so we'll take this information and hopefully we can become you know, a little bit proactive on, on what we're gonna do. And I'm, that it's really important to me to get this information so that we can look at our campus as we design out, we go from concept plans to real plans on the, on the um, campus is to figure out what, what we need to do to be as be future resilient, future prepared, whatever. I don't know, but it's going to be, going to be good information. And they are nationally known, and I'm so excited. But they don't—they love working with us down here. And and John flies fish, so he comes down and flies fishes <laughs> on the Deerfield River when he's so, for us. I don't yeah. know if you remember Pete, but that was—we went over to FERCOG to meet with the people that yeah. were working on this study right. before yeah. I was on the select board. Um, so, <laughs> and it was just as. Uh, Kate Sorry. was joining the Conscom, I think, or had yeah. just joined the Conscom. Yeah. Remember that meeting now. And if it's a fly fish, is it now, Kimberly? Uh, well, no, Kimberly. Kimberly, I'd, I'd have to go back and look through my email. Hey, Kimberly. Oh, Kimberly um, uh, 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 McPhee look up is the person that's up. handling it. It is McPhee. Okay. Yeah. She's going to, Kimberly He's, is the one that runs the program at the FERCOG, but she's all by herself right now. So. That's why it's been Kimberly's last name. Yeah, not, McPhee. McPhee. Um, That's I think that was one and of a, a quick uh, side knows her. tangent. Um, do you know? So Jackson Road used to be a big marsh, and now it's totally filled in. Exactly. I, that the, the creeks went up. Um, at the main street. Yeah. It's yeah. Coming across from it's where the yellow the corner of the yellow. The, there's a yellow house there where where we looked at um yeah. all of the Japanese knotwood that's yeah. Oh yeah. Right. And and that yeah. side of you know Bloody Brook is all filled in there too. So. Well, it, it's 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 really a great marsh. It is. This that was an area that I looked at several years ago. It's like what a place for the town to own. To have like a bird sanctuary, a bird watching area. It's a beautiful it's a swamp. It holds well, so Well, it used much to be water. open water. There used to be muskrats in there. Yeah, I mean, it, there's just millions of gallons in that. In so that it, it still is good water storage. Okay. But yeah, yeah. I was just wondering you, if we'd you, lost you it as water storage. You don't have a lot of water to have On a lot of water storage. Right, like, right. Right across okay. from Bittersweet is a wonderful swamp. It, it, it's a, a, a shrub swamp in there. The, the amount of water that thing holds, you know, especially in flood areas. Right now, it just I, okay. holds water, everything. I mean, I just but wondered. But that little area up there is, you know, coming down from the fields above, uh, across Taxon Road, and underneath it's, yeah, there's going to be some I, great birds I want to just say that MVP does fund restoration of, of wetland area. Yeah. Um, so so that, dredge, is that a dirty word? <laughs> No, uh, we don't dredge. We don't dredge. Dredges. But I mean, yeah. I, I just didn't know if we sh should somehow restore you, you really the capacity to, of... Yeah. In my current you, you have to do all the soil morphology and you have to look at what's happened to it, what the soil looks like. You have to look at where the... Um, because basically a wetland wants to become forested land. Right, that's, right. That's succession. succession. Yeah. So it's where it is in that succession of, of, of happening. And there's so many nice cattails up in there and um, things going on that it's a pretty good wetland for a while. But you'd have to do some really good soils and uh, vegetation studies and hydric soil, you know, and looking at everything up there to really understand where it is in that process. But that those whole fields up there hold a ton, a ton of water. Yeah, there's definitely lots of open water back like there. Yeah, They hold the water and then you get down to where all the houses are. And they have wonderful lawns they don't hold any water and that's where all the water comes in flows into that upper part so you'd have to look at where the water flow comes from um where it comes in how what the water flow mounts are you know and the hydrologies and, and so to the the yeah the that's soil folks know. figure I, out a lot of that stuff but it is a whole hydro I'd love to see hydrological study studies. with some arrows <laughs> well i mean we want to put in a buffer you know a native plant buffer you know, take out the invasives along Bully Brook on our town property and then put in a native uh, pollinator buffer. But, you know, we need somebody to come and explain 
to us where it should be and what we should do. And we have Owen already, the conservation district has Owen coming out and identifying, you know, the invasives and removal and all that with the highway department so that we they can be trained. We got to interrupt yeah. here. Yeah. 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 We've got five back no. No. We've got five minutes before we turn into pumpkins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's uh, let's, Sorry let's about wrap things up room. by saying no, that's um, great. our next meeting is uh, Wednesday, January 24th at 4 p.m. Reminder that on the 25th at 10 is the farmer meeting, which you're also invited to participate in. And um, what, what time was the 24th? 4 p.m. And will there be a Zoom link there will be, for yeah, those all, who are? All of them. Okay. <laughs> One announcement. Um, the uh, MA, can you speak? Oh, yeah. The climate leader um, program. Um, there's um, Chris Mason is going to come to the select board meeting and talk about the climate climate leader program, which is basically green communities 2.0. And if when when uh, the twenty. 20, oh, okay. 21st. 21st, I think you said. Oh, 21st. I can't, I, I can't remember. But it's... Um, it must be It must be our 24th meeting. Yeah, okay. 24th. And, um, and, I, it's, and, and the thing about it is, is that if we qualify as a, as a climate leader community, then we will qualify also for solar money, which is one of the reasons I'm from... We will be doing we will qualify so and there's a if. group of the, and geothermal money and yes geothermal. and geothermal money so but the but there are several hoops that we have to jump through mm -hmm. i've talked to allison gage um and she we have to come up with a plan uh and she i think she she was going to talk to chris and make sure that they have um technical assistance money for that but i'd really like that to move forward and so um I just wanted people to know that that is that to me that's a really another like MVP. It's essential for us to qualify. Well, it also seems like a really you know reasonable role for this committee to to, to play to be play part a role of. Yes, this, because that's gonna, part of the. You're going to tell what the eligibility includes. <laughs> we do have to uh, qualify for the opt-in stretch code, the new level. Yeah, but that's going to be mandatory, isn't it? Anyway, not yet. Oh, but this it's it is. The I mean, it, it's why build anything new that you have to go retrofit weatherize later, right? So, so I, there will be we'll do lots. Did we go to town meeting and already vote that? I mean, no, that was the old one. That was for green communities. This is for green communities 2.0. Oh. Sorry, I'm not talking to that. So, um, and it it's more stringent, and it's an opt in. Uh, it, I think that'll be the most controversial, the most work will be putting together the plan. Does that have to be done before we qualify? Yes. Uh, so you're talking about this town meeting? Yes. And Allison can make a presentation on that? Or um, well, that's what Chris Mason will be you, talking you about. Know, you do know that that's a lot of um, public outreach before our town meeting. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not um, saying that we are, Tim, Tim, Tim is, and I are a little, you know, burnt out about that. Uh, well, I just want to also, following up on that, apparently Heat is going to start announcing who got grant money awarded this month. Uh huh. I don't know if we'll be among the 15 communities that applied getting anything, and I don't know when we'll find out, but maybe by the end of February we'll know. Yeah. yeah. Was this a, is the heat grant that we applied for on geothermal, yes, yeah. right? Just yes. just so people know. So so MA, this is happening at the select board meeting on the twenty fourth, yes. where all these people Chris, are yeah. coming. And Chris, Chris Mason, who is oh, the um, DOER okay. Western so Mass Rep, then he's going to tell us what we need to do. Yes. Okay. Yes. So anybody in here who should attend and draw yes. should attend. Yeah. Okay. That's what I hope. That's why I want to make the announcement. Okay. And, and everyone when you say it. available for solar, you mean there'd be money okay. to put solar money. There's, there's money that we can apply. 
I mean, like green communities, we can yeah. apply for solar money. Right. It'd be great to be in the first wave of people who get approved because there's more money. Get all our all our all our solar panels put on all our roofs. So we also applied for feasibility study. Where that is that for for Frontier to um, oh, solar yeah. Right. Right. So we're we're look, the energy committee's looking Keep at reminding the people that don't just look at the whether the roof can currently take no, weight. The sides. Put it on the sides of the building. Well, yeah, I don't know that. I can every time anyone mentions it, I bring it up. Yeah, we bring it up. Just for you. I think of you every time. Yeah. <laughs> Buying in. Okay, MA, MA, we gotta have a game plan between now and the on the right. meeting. Well, yes, we'll yeah. we'll talk we'll talk so more. So we already have a meeting scheduled. We did. Okay, I good. Just, just said it was on the twenty fourth. Yeah, yes. exactly. Twenty fourth at four o'clock. Four o'clock, six o'clock. We have we're morning. being aggressive because we want Henry's participation. So yeah. Um, it's all your fault, Henry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I'll give you a break. Wait a minute. February. 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 January 24th is our next it's, meeting. It's only in two weeks. No, it's February 21st. I was right. Yeah, it's, Feb it's February 20. Is that the Wednesday? The board meeting it's, is February it's gonna, Oh, it's going to be February. That's the one that... Yeah. Um, 24th is a Saturday. So Christmas. Yeah. It's it's February twenty first, and that was what Casey said was the first available meeting. Really, to get on a schedule. So if you want to change that, I'd love to move it up because that's really crunching us. I think you We're gave them Chris. What's second. on our agenda on the twenty fourth? She gave us another one. I'm not available. I don't have it in front of me right now, but I can let you know tomorrow. Um. All right. Why don't can we tentatively put Emily on the um? And can you check? Verify to Chris that the person is available for the 24th, 24th of January, 24th of January. Yes, I'll check with Chris. Yeah, that's great. And uh, Chris, Chris will, Chris is holding, putting a placeholder on now. Yeah, I'll, t I'll text him when I get home. Okay. And find out. We'll coordinate with Chris to make sure we have all the right times. And I'll stuff. talk to you, Chris. <laughs> I'll talk to you, Chris. <laughs> Sounds good. Let us know whether we should do this. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Everybody will be here because we're we're having a meeting it's, that day. That's this is. It's for Thursday. I we, know. Oh, you do. You do. Has anybody started complaining about their electric rates yet? <laughs> we'll get it over eventually. I, I no one has electric <laughs> bills. I know. I I, oh. I tell Steve that. Uh, oh. Did we uh, call a meeting to close? Oh, um, we're adjourning the, I'll take a motion to adjourn the select board meeting. Move that we close. I'll second that. All those in favor? Yeah. All oh, aye. Aye, Carolyn. Okay, then we're going to also adjourn the MVP. I guess so. Thank you. All right.